people build it the same way as if we're building something over a house or you know off of a hill. It's just the same principles, it's just on a smaller scale. Yeah. Uh, this week on the show, we will be getting to know SWD master Grant Smith from Aqualink Pools. We learn how he got started in the business and where his passions are. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to the Ask the Masters podcast. This podcast is dedicated to discussions about the design and construction of water shapes. The hosts of the show are all certified SWD masters who represent the leading builders and designers within the water shaping industry today. Okay, welcome to the podcast today, and I'm here with Grant from Aqua Link Pools. And uh, you know, it, it feels kind of weird to introduce you because we talk on the de- on, on the phone what three, four times a day sometimes. Right. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So, yeah. So Grant and I do a lot of work together. SWD Master, um, just all around great pool builder here in Southern California. And so, uh, introduce yourself to those uh, in the audience that may not know you. Right. So um, yeah, I own a pool and landscape construction company. I'm a dual license contractor in the state of California. I hold a C53 and a C27 license. Um, we're based out of Carlsbad, California, although a lot of our work is up in Orange County and then the L.A. area also. Uh, San Diego is a great market, but it just doesn't seem to fit into our business model. We do do occasional pools down there, but generally our market is more up in the uh, Orange County area. So I did live in Orange County for a long time, so I'm used to the area. All my employees, I have 10 employees they're all up here in Orange County all my subcontractors are pretty much in the same area uh, so uh, that's pretty much our base of operation so I do a, a little bit of a commute every day but uh, you know it's a nice commute it's along the Pacific Ocean exactly. so <laughs> it's not like I'm sitting there in the desert or anything trying to work my way down uh, the freeway so yeah it's not like my commute and heading up into LA just sitting right. on the freeway looking at all the freeway yeah. billboards that's right a, that's the prettiest yeah. thing i get to look at going yeah. up there yeah i got the uh i probably drive through the only natural spot in southern california with no houses you know for 15 or 16 miles going through camp Pendleton there so yep. uh but yeah like i said we have 10 employees um we do all our own tile work masonry work landscape work uh, just because we kind of got into the thing of, you know, years ago, I got tired of dealing with landscapers and masons that did not properly know how to build around a pool. There's always a lot of finger pointing going on and, uh, and the quality just wasn't there, uh, you know, for, for those masons and what we're looking for, you know, to get to the next level. So, sure. yeah, I went, uh, went ahead and went out and got my C27 license and, uh, you know, we went on a hiring spree and, you know, uh, that we're, that we're here today. We do a lot of, we don't do that many jobs a year. Uh, probably I think we only did like eight, eight projects and half of those were like tile remediation projects, uh, okay. from pools that were either coming out of a construction defect, you know, scenario, or just four or five years down the road, the guy didn't do the tile work right. And we, you know, ended up redoing all the tile work. So, uh, so we don't get stretched too thin, uh, but we try to stick to bigger projects. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I want to back up a little bit more and just find out uh, from you, how did you end up in the pool business? I mean, was that your lifelong dream in high school? You wanted to be a pool guy? (laughs) No. Well, only when I saw that uh, Mark Harmon movie that came out back in the 80s. Yeah. 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 But uh, that was, uh, that whole thing was dispelled pretty quickly after I got in the business. That movie. Oh, exactly. Yeah, totally. Not what it was. Um, Well, I got out of the Marine Corps. uh, Well, I was getting out of the Marine Corps in 1994, like November 1994. So I'm originally from the Southeast. And uh, so I got out here at Camp. Pendleton spent five years here. I went all you were over stationed in Camp Pendleton. Stationed, stationed camp oh, Pendleton, I didn't right. realize that. Yeah, so that's how I ended up getting out here. I did uh, most of my initial training on the East Coast, and then they sent me out here. And you know, I went all over the world. You know, we did uh, been to Asia, you know, Southwest Asia, um, Africa, you know, Australia, all over the Pacific. Uh, so after that, we got done with that, and you know, it wears you down after a few years. Um, you yeah, know, it's time to get out. Uh, so a buddy of mine, we're gonna, we were exploring options on what to do. Unfortunately, you know, pulling a trigger doesn't really teach you a lot of marketable skills. Right. So you know, we had to go find something to do, and so a lot of Marines become police officers or cops. So. We figured the San Diego Police Department only paid like twenty six thousand dollars a year back in nineteen ninety four, and that was only like ten thousand more than we were making, you know, doing that. So we were looking for a little bit bigger payday. So we came up here. We tried out for the Orange County Sheriff's Department. We started okay. going through the process, and then they ended up going bankrupt. 
in oh, 1994. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I was like, that got put on a hold. Uh, he ended up going to just deliver, um, you know, fill up vending machines for two years. Hmm. And then he eventually ended up getting hired onto the, onto the de- department. And I just, but I needed something to do. And so my wife's um, uh, uh, family was in the pool business. He was a pool contractor. Okay. And he said, hey, I need somebody, my, old, my startup service guy's retiring. And I need somebody to help me do this. Uh, you know, startup pools would be a great, great opportunity for you. And so I started out with a very small pool route I bought from him, uh, like 12 pools in the Laguna Hills, uh, Laguna Niguel area. And then I did uh, startups. I did, you know, um, Decaseal, or we call it Mastic. Uh, and then I did uh, pool, weekly pool service. So I built that up from 12 pools to 80 pools. And about three years of that, I just got bored, sick of it, because you're just, unless, you know, Mondays were repair days, you know, replacing the heaters, pumps, filters. Back then, it was a lot simpler than it is now. Uh, but uh, so that'd be the only, like, break in the monotony of going to every pool every week, same same time, same channel, sure. and just, you know, cleaning the pool. And so I ended up getting, uh, wanting to do something different. So I ended up selling that route and uh and then getting more into the service side you know like commercial we commercial pool pumps you know, replacing those things you know hauling you know 300 pound motors out of pump pits mm-hmm. um, and then eventually we just you know the, the building side especially the the masonry side the landscape side always kind of interested me a lot um but uh, you know the masonry the finish work uh and then i got uh then i ended up getting my own license and and, and my C53, and then, because um, that was something I've been doing for years anyways. And uh, and for those uh, around the country, C53 oh, yeah. is your pool contract. It's pool contract in California. California. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, as you know, California is really you know, strict about their licensing requirements. So, sure. And then uh, after a while, we're in the backyard, and people are like, hey, can you do, you know, and I want to tie everybody in together. You know, I'd hire landscapers or masons or whatever to finish out the yard. Um, uh, and so eventually, though, it just got to the point where I just couldn't stand those people anymore and, you know, the quality they were putting out. So I ended up getting my C27 license, you know, or which is landscape license, uh, okay. you know, soon after that. So. so you can build structures, you can do right. all the barbecues, you right. can do all of that. Yeah. We can and do anything in a backyard. So one of our kind of uh, projects we just got finished with last March was a uh, huge uh, cantilever steel patio structure. Okay. And uh, so that's we can do all the way up to that. Um, it kind of freaked the neighbors out because we had the massive crane, you know, pulling a, a, um, a stru- steel structure, you prefabricated know, prefabricated and, structure yeah. over project Actually, not even so. prefabricated. It was fabricated off-site. Right, yeah, Custom. fabricated off-site. Yeah. And then uh, we basically attached the uh, the uh, pad, the cover part to the to the post. So, yeah. So cool. we're able to do anything in the backyard. Yeah. Uh, one theme, as we've done a number of these podcasts now, uh, one theme that has come out is that – uh, a number of us, me included, have come out of the service right. side of it. Um, and, and I really feel like guys that have come out of service, right. I think we make better pool guys because yeah. we've stood on our head fixing a heater. Right. And, and <laughs> yeah. you know, you, you think more about that kind right. of thing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the thing is like, you know, I hated, I hated when builders would put a motor like two inches away from the wall, you know, the house or the, or the, uh, or the equipment wall or whatever. And it's just, you know, like you said, you got to stand in your head just to get the thing out or even just cut the thing out and, you know, and one of my biggest things, I hate guys that set pipes uh, in concrete because back to the service days, that's a whole reason why that guy came out with those inside slip fittings, mm-hmm. you know, back in the 90s was because people would just like, you know, your level of your pipe above the concrete was only so much. And if you, you cut it out enough, you're going to end up running out of pipe. Back so. with the old brass pumps when they used to fry right, you know, yeah. the, the pipe and you had to replace them yeah, more right. regularly than now. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, um so how have you kind of morphed from that? Because you right. kind of, uh, you know, you have the, the hardscape. Of it. You're yeah. kind of moving really into uh, a, a lot more understanding of concrete and yeah. concrete science and, yeah. and really uh, doing a lot of pile pools and right. all of that. I yeah. mean, uh, explain how you yeah. kind of um, grew into that. Yeah. Well, the thing about concrete is like years ago, I'm kind of a... You know, I have a saying, you know, perfect practice uh, makes perfect. And I hate concrete cracks. I know it's going to crack. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it, but I absolutely hate it. And in fact, uh, when we're on vacation or whatever, I'm looking down at the ground <laughs> looking for concrete cracks because that's just my wife gets after me about that all the time. 
Uh, so I really started getting into the science of concrete and actually studying it. And my favorite classes are always about concrete, you know, whether it's shotcrete or flat work or whatever. Um, so I really got into that and found out all sorts of interesting things about it. And I realized, hey, you're, whatever you do, you're not ever going to prevent your concrete from cracking. So I just have to accept that point. Sure. Uh, so that's how I got into that. That's what interests me the most is, uh, you know, I, I, I love to have my finished work look perfect, but I actually take more pride in what's underneath the finished work. Mm -hmm. So that foundational work that we do, I mean, I'm kind of, I'm a, I'm a rule follower. So, you know, if there's a rule that needs to be followed and I know about it, then we're going to follow it. It doesn't matter what it costs us or what we do or, you know, because it's like, if I know about it, I have to do it that way. Yeah. Many people don't know uh, that, that we work together on a lot right. of jobs yeah. and, and we do a lot of your plumbing installs. I have a, a couple of plumbing crews and, right. and, and that's, that's one of the things I really enjoy. It's like, you're a rule follower and, and we know, you know, this is the pump that's going in. This is the right. size pipe. And, you know, there's, there's never any fudging with any of it. It's like, right. it's, it's, uh, and, and, and I really enjoy that. And that seems to be, you know, um, we're both part of uh, SWD. We both uh, have the honor of being SWD masters. But, right. you know, coming through Genesis University and yeah. all of that, just, you know, they really, that's really stressed within yeah. all of the education. And, and everybody has really kind of taken that to heart. Right, yeah. I mean, for me, it's, uh, seven years ago when I took the construction school, uh, when I was on, as soon as I left New Orleans on the plane, I was writing in the construction manual all the new procedures we were going to do. So it was like a whole new SOP we we're going to do. And we stopped like middle of the jobs that we were doing. Mm. And I actually ended up probably losing money on jobs because once again, it's like if that's the rule, then that's what we're going to do. Even if I'm losing money and my wife's looking at me like you're a nut. But that's just the way we do business. Um, so we slowly, I mean, we quickly transitioned from doing, you know, just the average, you know, I hate to say Jim Bob pool that everybody else does where sure. we thought we were doing fine because, you know, we had a clean record and we, were, and we never had any complaints and we never, you know, we never you know, had uh, you know, failure or anything. And then I realized after taking that construction course, we've actually been doing it wrong all this time. Right. So we totally changed and we did a 180, you know, overnight, literally. And uh, so, and then, and it, it's it's a tough go at first, you know. But then you start getting better projects, you know. Your knowledge that you get just from being, you know, a part of the SWD and taking those classes pretty much blows away everybody else. When when we go to meetings, people are like, "Gosh, it's like night and day compared to what you know we're used to." You know, the other four guys that came out of here. So. Sure. Yeah, and that's uh, that was my experience as well. I hear that a lot from the students is that uh, it changes the way that they do their business. Right. And um, your experience is very similar to mine in that as we changed, uh, there was a little bit of a bump in the road because sure. obviously doing it the right way costs a little bit more money. Sure. But yeah. uh, I, I know for me, and, and I see it with you too, you know, just the caliber of projects and the caliber of clientele that we – draw now right. and that are attracted to us um, yeah. you know wouldn't have even thought about using right. me 10 years ago uh, yeah um, you Absolutely. know and so yeah. uh, so the projects are better and they're they're more yeah. enjoyable they're more exciting they're more right. interesting uh, that's yeah. what keeps me going right yeah I have the same way here it's like you know we just hey this is the uh, you know we want to get into the higher end market uh, not I mean for financial reasons sure because you know Rich people always have money to spend, sure. you know, and no matter what the economy is doing. But it's also just a better, it's just you know, more challenging because, uh, you know, you can knock out like, you know, 100 pools and they're just all the same kind of pool. But when you actually get into, you know, I, I, my goal was to actually get down to four jobs a year. You know, I know that sounds crazy, but that's, you know, but I want like four, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollar or, or more, you know, those kind of jobs, which are sure. more challenging. Yeah, they're more stressful, but it also keeps us, you know, keeps me, you know, you know going and keeps me interested in it. Um, but I going back, though, saying that even a small pool like, you know, the one we were just doing in Tustin, mm -hmm. it's a small, simple pool spot combination. But we still build it the same way as if we're building something over a house or, you know, off of a hill. It's just the same principles. It's just on a smaller scale. Yeah. Um, so. And yeah, that, yeah, and I think that's one of the 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 misnomers that a lot of people believe about Genesis right. is that we all are doing you know crazy stuff. Right. And yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's right. really fun to put on my website some of the crazy yeah. pictures of jobs that we can put on the website. Right. Um, you know, uh, and we don't necessarily put some of the the more normal stuff on there. Right. Uh, but you and I are both doing those kind of pools yeah. and and. 
um, you know, the principles are the same right. no matter what you're doing. You know, yeah, and, right. and guys in the Midwest, you know, yeah, they're not going to be putting in a two and a half million dollar backyard right. in the Midwest, but that doesn't mean they can't be the best right. at what they are. Yeah, even if it's just a, a twenty by forty rectangle, I mean, you can build that thing with the same principles as building it. You know. On a two point five million dollar pool, yeah, so the same principles apply. So, and that was that rough transition for us was that one spring, well, like the next spring especially, um, you know, sometimes my wife would look at me and go, you know, are we going to pay the mortgage this month? You know, just because we I didn't do one pool for four months, mm. so because we were underbid, 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 and so that transition was like extremely tough for us for a few months. But once we got into that loop. You know, then it just kind of took off from there. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things I always tell people, you know, why, why should we go take the classes? We're never going to build that kind of pool. Right. And and um, you know, it's it's not it, your local market is your local market. Right. And and there's multiple people in most of the marketplaces of people that are listening here. And you can be the best within your market. Right. It doesn't mean you have to build, you know, right. a million dollar job. Right. You can still learn the principles and sure. everything to become the best. And that's yeah. Yeah. that's what I think the big thing I'd like to get across is yeah. that the Genesis University program is not for, right. you know, just guys doing million dollar jobs. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it just even if all you do is build spas, which we seem to be doing a lot lately just right. <laughs> because of the size of the yards we're dealing with now. But even if you just build a spa, I mean, that could be just a very well built you know vessel and uh or fountains we do fountains all the time we lose fountain bids all the time because we want to build it like a pool you know pump filter you know some kind of uh you know chemical system on it even if it's just a simple bromine feeder or something and we're always more expensive than you know by over twice but the thing with fountains is like you go to someone's yard most of the times if they have a fountain with just a sump pump it's empty or green so, exactly yeah, yeah so. they never look good uh, they never look good the fountains we years. build you know you can actually yeah. enjoy them right exactly so that's kind of but that's what you can apply those same pool principles even just building a simple fountain your customer is going to be happier um you just your reputation is going to be way better and your liability is less you know because you're doing it the right way and you know, you're not going to get caught in this trap of if you have a failure, then I know that even if we have something, if we had something go wrong, um, we did everything humanly possible, you know, followed all the codes, all the guidelines. And so it's just, I was saying, if something goes wrong, it must just be an act of God or something because, you know, we tried to do everything, you know, the right way. Sure. Yeah, let's uh, let's jump into yeah. a little bit about the um, the new Ask the Masters Facebook page. Right. Yeah. Uh, you great. know, you're really a, a, a deeply a part of that. Right. Um, you know, you and I and Paulo yeah. and Rick Chafee and um, you know, uh, tell me a little bit about your involvement and yeah. and uh, and what you're seeing and what you're hoping yeah. for it as we kind of continue yeah. to see this thing mature. Yeah, I'm glad that you, that we came out with it. You know, just because uh, there are different pages on there, like, you know, pool industry, um, you know, mastermind, there's like workers only thing. But the problem sometimes I see with those uh, pages is they kind of get into, hey, look at the filter I just cleaned today. Or, you know, I found a salamander in the pump basket or whatever. So, sure. so it's really great that we have this forum now where people can actually get on here and we're, and, you know, we're putting out content of you know just even if it's even if it looks like drilling case on or drilling piers or waterproofing you know we're at least getting the word out there that this is the really the proper way to do it this is a code we you know we'll list the code and how to do it and uh so it just gets more people interested in it as from a construction standpoint and we've gotten a lot of positive feedback so far you know with just hey that wow that's great you know let's uh you know i didn't know that or you know or this is oh that's the way to do it you know or if they're actually going to drill up here for the first time they know what to look for you know from the drill company because sure. you know the drill companies don't always follow the rules either so they they some can contractors go, don't right? know everything. no i know <laughs> crazy right that's just insane so <laughs> that's a that's a blasphemous statement so but yeah so they can watch the drill company and say hey wait a minute we're supposed to be doing this way and, th and they may not even know the worker may not even know or they don't care or whatever so it, it, so that that part of the 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 facebook page is great uh just because uh, you know you were and i'm going to keep putting out content you know once or twice a week you know even if it's just simple stuff or short things about mainstream landscape or even landscape stuff you know stuff even if it's just irrigation systems i think uh we'll i'll post something like that every once in a while just to kind of you know because we're getting away from you know pop-up heads um you know in irrigation we're doing more drip systems you know just because they're way more water efficient so sure it's just a great forum for all that stuff 
Yeah, and, and, and we do hope to take it outside of just the backyard swimming pool right. conversation into, you know, more architects and engineers right. and, and landscape. I mean, right. it's, you know, we're not just uh, a, a part of the backyard. You know, we're, right. we, we really need to think of the sure. whole the whole thing is a holistic, right. you know, system, and yeah. the pool should be a part of it. Uh, but it's not; it's not even always the most important yeah. part. You right? Know? Yeah. Well, that's the whole thing of getting the architects involved because, you know, a lot of architects uh, we get plans from architects, like house architects in particular. Um, it'll just be like some square box in the backyard, and they pull by others. Right, uh, pull by others, and it's like, okay, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And so, if they would understand the pool industry a little bit better, and then the pool industry, if we can talk to architects better. I think the forum, this page, if we can get everybody involved in that direction, then, you know, that's the great thing about Genesis is, you know, it's just not down to the pool guy. It's also architects and engineers. And, you know, I took a hydraulics class you know, two years ago and uh, there was an engineer sitting in there from Florida. So mm. um, so that's what the great thing about Genesis is just it's it's hopefully we'll cover everybody, get everybody involved in it and we'll all be on the same page. Yeah, and to me, the Ask the Masters page on Facebook is just, it's an extension of the classroom. Yeah, right. It'll never replace the classroom. No, uh, no, but, right. you know, it, it's it's a place where, yeah, kind of my hope for it is that, um, you know, you do have some of the industry leaders that are a part of that page. Right. And it's it, it allows people to access guys right. like you and me. You know, right. I mean, you're so good with foundations yeah. and concrete and all of that. And right. somebody can jump in there and ask a question. And, yeah. You know, maybe not 10 minutes later, but, you know, yeah. within a day or two, you're going to be right. able to jump in there and, and give some general advice and, and yeah. at least point them in a direction. Yeah. And that's the great thing about the forum is like I mean, the, some of the complaints we've heard over the years is like, oh, you guys aren't accessible. Sure. You know, even though I sit at the booth every year and I say, here's my number or you can look up, look me up in the catalog. My phone number is on there. The email is on there. And, and we do all get calls every once in a while. But there seems to be some kind of perception that we're not, attain you know, that people can't talk to us. Sure. And it's like, that's not true. I mean, any time. And so this forum is, a, like you said, a great avenue for those people to feel comfortable, you know, and just ask a question and, you know, get some help in an area to, you know, get some information. Yep. Yeah, so uh, I know we're doing a couple of uh, big case on projects with you. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk just a little bit more about kind of um, foundations and right. helicals and all of right. that. Uh, so let's talk a little yeah. bit about that, if you will. Yeah, so caisson are concrete piers. I mean, caisson is technically a, um, a definition for a casing that goes around a poured concrete pier that if you're working in water or like unstable soil, that's actually what the caisson actually means. But it's kind of like Kleenex and tissue. Sure. You know, it's the same kind of... in Gunite shakrit. Gunite shakrit, yeah. Everybody kind of uses the same word. So, you know, when we're on it, when we go out, when we first go out and talk to a homeowner, you know, if we're not dealing with some flat track lot on a mass graded, you know, hill or something, uh, but even then, depending on what kind of pool they want to do, uh, you know, we don't really get into gray beam and caisson or pier, you know, conversation or even the helical piers, just because, you know, soils engineer, our first step is always soils engineer. So, so we come out, I come out onto a property and they have a slope and they want the pool on the slope. And I say the first thing we have to do is we've got to get a geotechnical engineer out here to take a look at this thing. I'm not going to even tell you how much this thing is going to cost because I, I, I'm not a magician. I can't see underground. Um, I don't have x-ray vision so let's get that guy out here first a problem i see in a lot of the industry is that you know people just design an entire backyard an entire pool and they have no idea how much this thing costs because they have no idea what kind of foundational work it's going to need and even outside of california here we have to get structural engineering right I mean, that's correct. required yeah. here but you go to other states across the country uh, there really seems to be a big fear of engineers in right. general know, within yeah. the pool industry. Yeah, which is to me kind of uh, strange because like I'm not going to take the responsibility for the structure. I didn't go to college for four years. You know, I only play engineer when I'm on TV. Um, so it's like I'm going to let the professionals handle this. I'm just going to once again I'm a rule folder. Right. So if that engineer says that piece of rebar needs to be here, that's where we're going to put that piece of rebar. So um, so that's just how it works. With I mean that's the first thing is getting that geotechnical out there. Once he formulates a plan, then I can tell the structural engineer, or at least I may have an idea. I mean, maybe I can start working on at least a rough number of what they're looking at. But if they need some kind of really extensive foundational work per the geotechnical engineer, then I'm going to get it to a structural engineer, and then we're going to actually bid it out properly. So Yeah, and, and it's not always, you know... Uh 
we get reports and 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 that uh, and and just even to back up a little bit. So it's really, it's the soils guy that right. dictates whether That's, it's not yeah. you saying it's going to be case under right. even really the structural Sorry, engineer. Correct. The soils yeah. guy yeah. is the one that dictates that. Right. Uh, but I know I read reports regularly where you have an option. Right. Um, yeah. Sure. You know, yeah. and and so it doesn't necessarily. Like if you're going to do just a traditional pool right. and you know no infinity edge detail yeah, right. or anything like that, and you're okay with a half an inch of rotation right. of the vessel, yeah, sure. um, you know maybe you don't need caissons. Right. But if you're doing a you know 140 feet right. of yeah. perimeter overflow right. on a pool and it's got to be dead money perfect, yeah. you know that quarter of an inch of settlement yeah. doesn't work. Is so it, yeah, exactly, you know sometimes yeah. you can redesign the entire right. project uh, to fit a budget yeah. right. without you know without it, it, caissons are not the death sentence uh, for yeah. a pool right, you can correct. still yeah. go yeah. to a different design sometimes yeah. well it's kind of like a recent project you know we, we just uh, didn't you know in Newport Beach on the in, in the uh, in the hills there you know you did the mechanicals on it um, it, it was awesome soil it's like been there since the dinosaurs mm -hmm. and we had a back and forth with the city building department because both the structural engineer and the soils engineer said you know just we'll put a key in there a, a deep key now granted and what's a deep key a key is like a footer we, sh we shouldn't really say it's a key it's a footer it's a footer for a pool it's just kind of like even a, a house, you know how you do a foot around the edge of the house mm -hmm. on a slab on grade, and that's basically what it, we define it as a key. It's really a, you shouldn't really say key. It's just a deepened footer for a pool. It kind of it just locks that pool into the hill. Uh, but because it was such good soil, both the engineers thought, okay, well it's a vanishing edge pool, but it's original, you know, what we call bedrock, but it's, it's sandy type soil. We're not going to think this thing's going to move. You know, going to you know sink a quarter inch on the on one end or the other. So you're good. But the but the soils engineer of the city thought, well. Oh, no, we, you want to put this thing on caissons. And it's like, and so it was this back and forth. It was like a month and a half of just going back and forth with it. Mm. And that is true. A lot of times we'll, we'll, we'll tell people with vanishing edge pools or permanent overflow pools, if you're on engineered fill, especially in engineered fills where it's a man-made deal. Artificial, hill, yep. Artificial. If you really want to do this and you don't want to, and the soils engineer will put this in his report, if you don't use case on the gray beans, you could have that deflection. You know, it could just sink a quarter inch on the side. And maybe if you don't want to spend all the money on the gray beans and, and caissons, then go ahead and just put a thickened like granite or something on top of the edge wall. Come back and grind it every few years or something to get it more level. Yeah, out, just true so. the edge out. Every yeah, just true the edge out. So if you tell people that, then that's they can make their decision sure. on whether they want to spend the you know, $120,000 on, you know, caissons and gray beams, sure. uh, you know, but if you're dealing with good soil, like bedrock, um, yeah, you shouldn't really have that big of an issue, uh, you know, of that settling like that. So. Yeah. Our first, uh, the first perimeter overflow pool that we did, it, it kind of a, a spool, uh, it was a 10 by 15. Right. Uh, but yeah, we were down by the coast and we had yeah. really, really good sand, uh, right. sandy soil that was, uh, had enough that it would stick together, um, yeah. and so this guy came out and gave us a green light. We didn't have to do it on caissons yeah. or anything because right. the sand was not going to compress, and, yeah. and that's been, gosh, that's been nine or ten years right. now, and and it still flows perfectly and, right. and still performing as yeah. you know, you know. So, it, yeah, if you want to do that type of construction, yeah. uh, it, it doesn't necessarily always mean that it has to be right. case on gray beam right. as well. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's something that the homeowner and the pool contractor are going to have to come to an agreement to, you know, if they, if it is that the souls, it, but once again, it goes back to the souls engineer, sure. you know, he's going to be the one that's, you know, it's kind of like you're spreading the liability around a little bit, you know, but because he's the expert on it. Uh, so we should go off of that. I even use, I take the souls report and I actually use that on how to do my masonry work, my decking, you mm -hmm. know, r around the area. I just don't pour a three and a half inch thick slab, you know, because um, that's, you know, we want to have a rebar three inches off the, off the dirt per ACI. Correct. Same ACI code that goes for pools is the same for concrete on, you know, slab on grade. Sure. Uh, so, and then we actually will do, so that's a minimum of five and a half inches of concrete. Uh, and then if we have, if we're dealing with expansive soil, which we do a lot here, you know, especially in Southern Orange County, uh, we do like a turned on footer on all the edges. You know, we saturate our soil according to the soils engineer. We had to have like a 30% moisture content in the soil before we even put down our compacted road base. Mm -hmm. And what that does is basically just pre-expands the soil so that if water does get up underneath there even though you have a turned on footer you may be at the bottom of a hill and all that water is traveling down through the hill and it's going to end up under your slab sure even if you have a 12 inch deep footer and that but that way your soil is pre-expanded it's not going to you see decks that uh, we get calls every once in a while, oh my pool sank 
No, you go out there, no, your deck's raised up yeah. because they didn't do proper you know, uh, prep underneath the deck. Even if we're doing pavers, which is more and more nowadays because people hate cracks in concrete. You know? <laughs> so, Where did well, they get that? Yeah, I, know, I, know, I, know. <laughs> I don't tell them that. But they just come out and say they don't like it. Uh, we'll do like 8 to 9 to 12 inches of compacted road base okay. uh, just because we take that foot of bad soil out of there. We know that acts the same as, say, 6 inches of concrete with number 4 rebar 12 inches on center. So it has the same effect. Fact. So we really base, I always, like I said, Soul's your guy to me. He's the most important guy on the job site. Yeah. And, and you know, we work with a number of different soils companies yeah. regularly and, and I get to know the guys, you know, right. it's, 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 you have to, you have to learn to deal with the engineers. Right. And, and sometimes we have one in particular that can be real tough, right. yeah. uh, but you know, we've yeah. gotten to know each other right. and we build a rapport and, and for the yeah. most part, they're there to just help the job go better. You know, right. they're not in there just to right. make your life miserable. miserable. Yeah, right. They're kind of there to keep you out of trouble. Like even correct. Even if we just do a landscape only job, I'll just have them come by, do a quick look around the. You know, and most of the times it's some, like I said, some tracked home lot, uh, graded, mass graded. A uh, lot, and uh, so we just have him come by, and he can say, "Oh, you have sandy soil, or you have expansive soil." Write a quick report. I know how to base all my decking and everything off of, off of that. So. And the steel schedules in your engineering for the pool shell, right? And correct. All of that. Yeah, and all that. So it's just, I mean, he's like I said, the most important guy. Yeah, one of the things um, that that we uh, are just starting to see a little bit. Um, uh, we bid a job right on Newport Harbor just recently, uh, and it was going to be a small, uh, real small pool, right. uh, but we were right up against the high tide line yeah. and where the client wanted to put it. And so uh, caissons were going to be really expensive, right. and she wanted to do a perimeter overflow detail, right. and, and uh, it, it wasn't going to be a real simple um, right. And the soils guy actually came back and recommended helical piles. Right, yeah, uh, sure, yeah. It was like a fraction of the yeah, cost. Right, so we're still yeah. working on that right now. So right. Uh, can you explain a little bit yeah. about helical piles and, yeah. and that whole theory behind that? Right. So a helical pile is just like a corkscrew. You know, like a wine, you, know, you have your wine corkscrew. It's, it's pretty much that's what it looks like, except for it just has a thicker blade. And so the engineer, he'll spec out uh, a certain number of them in the pool, depending on the pool size, how deep they have to go. And then you just screw them, basically you screw them into the ground. And uh, then you come out and you connect your pool steel to that heel, that, that, that pile, uh, helical screw. Um, and that's what supports your pool because you've screwed. It's kind of like the old days of just pounding timbers, mm -hmm. you know, into muck. Ah, they, yeah. it's not even old days. Yeah, they they're still, still doing, doing it. Yeah, Martha's still doing Vineyard, yeah. out in New York, all right. out and through there. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so that's what basically, uh, you know, the helical pile is. It's just a big screw that goes in the ground. You connect your pool structure to it and that just evenly dis distributes out the weight and uh it's and it's great applications for you know mucky you know mucky dirt, a lot cheaper too than yeah what dirt. was real nice on this one we didn't have to get a access was really a problem yeah. so we couldn't get a big drill, drill rig, rig in there or anything yeah. and they yeah. can come in with just a little bobcat and right you know it's it's probably not appropriate for every job right um because they're they don't they're not as strong right. um so you have to put more of them yeah, in correct, yeah. they'll perform just as yeah. well, but you have to have quite a few more of them than right. if you were, you know, yeah. so if you have a pool that is going to have maybe 10 or 12 caissons, yeah. you know, you, right. you probably doesn't make sense to come in and put 30 helicals yeah. in there. Right. You yeah. know, so there's, there's definitely a place, but yeah. uh, it was really interesting to me because it was kind of a newer thing um, that, that I was aware of, but, um, right. you yeah. know, I, I, I'm just learning about it myself yeah. in the last year yeah. or so. I know a lot of people in Florida, they do a lot of that down there. And then oh, that some, would make sense. Yeah, place, uh, certain places in the Midwest. I see, you know, they do a certain amount of that because, you know, drilling is not everybody has a drill rig. I mean, we got a lot of drill rigs out here in Southern California because we have a lot of hills. So those drill companies are more readily available. I'm, yeah. And in Florida with all the swampy and, and right, everything yeah. there. Yeah. Right. So it's just uh, so it's just a different application. Yeah. I mean, and I see, you know, other people in, like I saw a guy in Australia building a pool and they were still pounding, you know, wood down into the into the swamp. And, you know, a lot of if you've been to Europe and a lot of the old medieval cities, a lot of that was built on wood and they're still standing there, mm -hmm. you know, 600 years later. Like you go to these massive churches and you find out, oh, it's built on a swamp, but they but they pounded in like you know eight hundred logs or something underneath this thing. It's still there. So yeah, you think about that. How did they do that in the eighteen hundreds? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, a lot of labor. So yep. Um, yeah. So that's another way to go with it. Um, uh, uh, you know, the the footer for the for the pool. That's another another way to do with it. Um, 
And there's, you know, you can even, I've, I've never seen it done on the pool, but of course, you know, they, you have concrete piles, you know, you can pound those in the ground too, but I've, I've mm-hmm. never seen them done for a pool. But generally out here in Southern California, Northern California, it's going to be more, you know, the, the caissons or a drilled you know, concrete drilled, caisson. Drilled concrete caisson. So we just recently bid out and we're going to do the job in November. Uh, we couldn't make it in time because the lake was rising up. Oh. But uh, about eight of the ca- eight of the caissons will actually be, uh, well, most of the pool during certain times of the year will be submerged. Uh, in the lake. I mean, the lake water doesn't crest the, the surge basin or the pool, but the foundational work in the pool itself is halfway submerged in the lake half the year. Wow. So, uh, that'll so, make for some great photos. It, it will, yeah. So, when we get done with it, it'll be really nice. Um, but it was all blue granite, and we were going to have to drill through blue granite. Oh, wow. To get all the caissons in uh, about 15 feet down. But since a lot of the, a lot of the caissons were like kind of in the lake area, uh, and we'll still be in the lake area when we actually start. We'll have to use what's called a, a tremi method, which mm-hmm. is I know you've done before. Yep. Um, and that's basically where you know we got to st- stick a pipe down in the caisson because the caisson is filled with water, and we're going to push the water out with the concrete as we. Yeah, you know, the concrete it displaces so, it. Displaces it, it comes, it up, and, comes up, and, and then you're pumping so. the water out the top. Right. So, and that's a whole, doing that kind of work too is a whole different like integral waterproofing system we have to come up with in a, in a protocol. So uh, that was our you know we wanted to make sure that our water our in, integral waterproofing that we we're going to do. Is going to be compatible with our, you know, uh, our topical waterproofing. So it's a lot of thought process that goes into that kind of, kind of structure. And you know, I know you're used to this too. But some of these projects, you know, we're bidding these things out like three weeks, you mm-hmm. know, and we're spending 40, 50 hours on it. But yeah, that's yeah, I got a gal in my out. office that that yeah. uh, she does a lot of the initial legwork on it, right. uh, and and she may have 20 or 30 hours before I even right. start to yeah. look at it. Right. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You're not you're not putting a bid to these uh, jobs in in yeah, two or three hours. Yeah. So. Overnight. So exactly. So. Um, so yeah, uh, the foundation work, I mean, I, it's something I, I love doing, I guess. I know it's, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it does keep me up at night. Sure. But, uh, you know, it's all part of the concrete process. So if you just understand that concrete process and the way these things work and you make the drill company or the whatever company actually do the work the right way, you know, it's actually goes pretty smoothly. Yeah. And yeah. concrete is concrete. And yeah, that's, concrete. Yeah, right. That, that's, uh, I think, one of the big misnomers that I think a lot of people believe is that shotcrete's not concrete. I right. Mean, it's yeah, all, right. It's all concrete. It's, it's all the same material. Right. It's all sand right. and cement and, right. and different ratios. Right. And, you know, you're putting bigger rock in your deck than what you're right. shooting through a hose. But right. but concrete is concrete and the science is the same. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, um, and so yeah, if you just know that, if you learn that, then, you know, the rest is going to be, you know, fairly straightforward for you to do. So, um, yeah, going back to some of the piers, like the job that we're probably going to be starting up here soon, um, is we're having to hand dig, you know, caissons mm. that are 30 feet deep. So that's, uh, that gets into a whole nother thing with OSHA exactly. and the way you have to dig them. Um, you know, it's a lot more expensive. Obviously you got to hand dig and get the spoils out. Um, so it's, uh, but they're diggable. I mean, you know, some, they had the smallest guy down there digging it, but, and we've had to do that some of ourselves on some, uh, cantilever deck, um, you know, uh, caissons or, you know, footings, uh, we've had to dig down 12, 13 feet hand dig, you know, cause we couldn't get a drill rig in there sure. you know, to get it up. And you have to shore the hole as you go down, you know, make sure you have everybody with the safety gear on and harnesses yep. and everything else. So yeah. And monitoring yeah. And, and one guy on top monitoring the whole time and, and just, you know, working your way down slowly, but surely. So, uh, but it's every, I always say everything's doable. You just got to figure out a way to do it. Well, and, yeah. and. Client has to have the budget too. Right, the budget too. Yeah, that's, uh, that's that comes thing. into yeah. effect yeah. too. Yeah, and that's the thing too is when you're when you go into those kind of projects, you know, just so somebody doesn't get into trouble, you can't sit there and say, okay, it's only going to cost this much to do the piers. Yeah, you may not know. You may not know for sure. Yeah, the souls guy is going to come out, but some of that is also a little bit his guesswork based on like old USGS surveys or like previous construction things like that. You know, you may end up drilling half the half the piers like ten feet more than the souls guy thought you know so you have to get your customer prepared for that extra cost yeah that's uh let's talk about that a little bit because um you and i are both aware of that but that's a great point that you brought up we just finished a uh a job and we as we were drilling um we hit a slab of concrete uh, of uh, not concrete a a slab of rock that was down and the soils guy said that you know he thought that we may but he thought that we were going to be okay yeah and i think we had 12 piles in this pool and two of them we could not get to our depth Uh, we literally we got down about nine feet and the pile was supposed to go 16 feet and we hit we hit a slab 
right. and it wasn't in the soils report right. it wasn't anything um, I actually did send one of my guys down there with a two foot long just a half inch drill bit yeah. uh, to drill through to see That's how it, yeah. thick it was and we never got through it right. and so we ended up having to go back in, re-engineer everything, right. uh, resend it right. to the city, um, you know. And so that's yeah. one of the things that that um, is good to understand is that just right. because you have a budget mm -hmm. for caissons, right. you you never know what you're going to hit, right. um, yeah. you know. Yeah. And and fortunately, the client was aware of that yeah. and made aware of that beforehand, right. yeah. and they knew it was a possibility, but. You know, it ended up costing more. We had about a two-week delay as yeah. the engineers reworked it. And, right. and uh, you know, in that situation, we were able to go back in and make yeah. the caissons quite a bit wider. Right. Um, you know, we basically doubled the width of the caisson, changed the steel in there for those two caissons. Because right. um, there was no way. We drilled on yeah. one of them for five hours and yeah. got three inches. Right. So yeah. Um, yeah, you had to bring in, like the, like the project I was mentioning earlier about all the blue granite, we were going to bring in a, a drill rig that was as, uh, on a huge uh, a cat, caterpillar uh, mm. track hoe. So like you see along the freeway digging, yep. you know, digging out the freeways, that's what our plan was. It was to come in and we we're predicting that we'd be able to drill about two holes a day. You know, because initially we were like, okay, well, let's get this, at least the outer structural wall in before the lake rises because the homeowner was really wanting to get this thing going. Uh, but we were just kind of delayed with some. Um, well, we've had so know, much rain this year Rain, in that's, yeah, that thing. So, um, and we were trying to figure out, hey, we get the outer wall in. So our plan was coming, bringing this huge track hoe in you know, with the drill bit on it and just power through that granite. So uh, we'll see what happens in November. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it'll be fun to watch, the, uh, watch yeah. that one as it develops. Right. And, and the thing about when going back to the drill companies is like, uh, the great thing about learning how to do things the right way mm. is you can teach others how to do things the right way. Now it could be, it's going to be a challenge, sure, because you're going to be going against people that I've been doing this for 30 years and right. you know that kind of thing. And so the, you get, be a little careful with the drill companies because they you know you want to make sure your hose is down near the bottom of the hole. I think as you're the, filling it up. As you're filling up, I think the ACI code is uh, eight feet. Um, but I know some people say it's 10 feet, but I think it's actually eight feet because your cement and your paste, uh, which is your, your cement is your paste and your aggregate can all start falling apart. If you have a 65 foot hole, you're just letting it drop 65 feet. You know, gravity is going to take over and, yep. and it hits you, the bottom right, and just explodes. It just, it's, exactly. So you want to make sure your spoils are out of the bottom of the hole. Those are just the, you know, the, the stuff that falls in the hole as you're drilling it. They actually have a little clean out device that the drill rig uses to clean out the hole. You know, if, if you're, if you're, Obviously, it's going to be really hard to get a concrete hose down 60 feet, but you may have to just run a crane mm -hmm. and actually crane That's what we've that had hose to do in the past. Yep. Yeah, down in there and then bring it up slowly with the crane. So you have to kind of figure out all those expenses when you're doing that kind of foundation work. Um, so and then you fill it up as you go and you have to vibrate it, um, you know, because you're trying to get around all that rebar, especially some cages are really tight and you want to get all your concrete around the rebar. So, you know, if you have an odd that if your caisson comes out of the out of the hole like it does sometimes, you know, you want to see a nice you know you vibrated it correctly when you see a nice impression of the sauna tube um, and it looks nice and clean and and, yeah. and slick and everything so yeah i mean i've seen guys sit there take rebar try to push the concrete back and forth or you know there uh, i saw one guy with a wheelbarrow on a video like pouring caissons with a wheelbarrow oh, and like half the dirt was going in then half concrete and you know it was just a little it's like gosh you know you guys really need to keep up on this stuff so uh, so really, the education is the key to it all. Yeah, and it allows you, it just gives you the empowerment as right. a builder. You know, right. um, uh, you know, sad to say, but uh, yeah. people do the least amount that they Correct. can get yeah. away with. And, right. and once you understand, you know, you can hold your contractors, your subcontractors right. to, hey, you know, this is the way it's supposed to be done. Right. And, yeah. you know, and they'll tuck their tail and go, yeah, I know. And, yeah. you know, right. and, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. and that. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't know, you don't know. Right. And, and that's that's where the real danger comes in. That's right. why I love education. Yeah. I still, you know, uh, just just last week I took another Genesis class. Right. You know, even though even though you and I are both masters. Yeah. Um, I mean, you just recently yeah, I just took got one too. taking yeah, Mike Nance's uh, class, which was great. And, uh, you know, we don't, don't design anymore. And it was really frying my brain, you know, being in that class. And at the end of the, 
the first day or second day, Mike comes out and goes, are you okay? Because you don't, you're not saying anything. You have your head down and you're kind of saying, Mike, this is like giving me a headache just because I used to do all my own designs back in the old days. And, and even after I learned how to do perspective drawing, I thought it would be really cool to do a perspective drawing for every design I did. Of course. Yes. Just to be, cause it kind of blows people away. They're so used to computer age. And right. they, I thought, well, if they see that I'm taking the time to do this perspective drawing, they're going to be like, God, this guy really cares about, you know, my yard. And so it was a selling point kind of but then after i got into more and more of working with architects and landscape architects i just get sent plans sent to me all the time and i just don't ever sit down and design so taking mike's class uh back in uh, uh february was really a really good thing for me because it kind of got me back into thinking about you know design and and you know drawing again and that kind of thing so. yeah so even uh you know even us as masters you yeah know, we're still continuing to Absolutely. take classes yeah. and and yeah. uh you know yeah. the Genesis has a number of new classes coming up this fall right. that, uh, that I'm actually real excited yeah. about. And, and so, you know, yeah. it, that's what it's all about, just continuing your education, and yeah. you've never arrived. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I still learn, just like yeah, on the forum, they asked the masters. Um, you know, Kevin uh, from Dynamic Pools and Spas had put on something about, you know, detail that it showed them using unistruts and stainless steel rod. And Paul was like, oh, well, you should really do it this way because it's a lot easier, a lot cheaper, and it's just a way to do it. I'm like, wow, I never thought of that. But, um, you know, but the way I had just got done with one, and I read the article, and I was like, oh, man, I wish I had done it like that because I know that's a way better way to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's, the way we did it was the normal standard way to do it, but the way that Paul I had spec'd it out in the article was just, but if I ever, when I do one next time, that's how we're going to do it. So, sure. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, so, yeah. um, it's been great talking yeah, to you. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, so, I'll talk to you probably in yeah. 10 minutes about right, exactly. you know, one of our other jobs. <laughs> yeah, right. but, um, yeah, yeah. I always love just bringing guys in that, that really understand and are passionate about, you know, their certain aspects yeah. and, and, you know, even, I mean, you and I talk and, and I'll call you and Hey, you know, yeah. what do you think about this, this concrete and, right. and how I'm forming it? And, and, you yeah. know, I mean, it, it's great to be able to have, you know, you and I work together right. because we're, we're, we're um, in the same market, yeah. uh, but you know, just being able to have that sure. camaraderie, I'm sure I would yeah. be, you know, we'd be having those same conversations if we lived across the country from each other. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Eve, I mean, we talk to people, you know, another, you know, I call Brian Van Bauer every once in a while, or I just ask him, you know, one time he had to really kick me in the butt one day, uh, you know, get me motivated again. So, right, right. <laughs> so, but they're always available, you know, to talk to. So, yeah, yeah. Great. Well, thanks for joining yeah, us today. I'm glad to be here. Cool. All right. Thanks for listening to the Ask awesome Masters podcast. And don't forget to check out our Facebook page each week on Tuesdays for new episodes of the show. I also want to encourage you to stop by the Ask the Masters Facebook page and invite other like-minded individuals to join us there as well. Feel free to jump into the conversations and even post your own questions. We want to create a community which fosters learning and discovery for the betterment of us all. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify please be sure to subscribe and feel free to share.